Okay. Okay, hopefully you can now see uh, the presentation. So, uh, well, the, there's the title, uh, the title which was suggested to me, um, based, I think, on my uh, background and uh, record on these things. Uh, let's see what we can do to justify something like that. So here's the outline of the talk. First, I'll talk about uncertainty and about aleatory and epistemic uncertainties. Then probability, frequency and subjective probabilities. Then I'll talk about what I call measured probabilities. I'll talk about elaboration and the role of probability theory. I'll talk about elicitation, which is what I think of as the state of the art in probability measurement. And then I'll talk about imprecision, which uh, I think is a, a topic of great interest to people organizing this meeting. So let's talk about uncertainty first. Uncertainty is everywhere. There's so many things I'm uncertain about. So here's a couple, the atomic number of cesium. I don't know, I'm not a chemist. I don't know what the number of cesium is. Uh, some people might know this and uh, some people might have a better guess than I have. Uh, but whether it will rain here tomorrow, probably nobody else in this meeting knows better than I do whether it's likely to rain here tomorrow, but still I'm uncertain, I'm uncertain about that. Uh, suppose I drop a drawing pin, what I call a drawing pin, Americans call a thumbtack, which is actually a nice name for it. Uh, I drop that on the table. Um, which way will it fall? Will the pin up or the pin down? Head up or pin up? How many times will it fall head up in five tosses? I don't know. What's going to be the closing price of the London Stock Exchange Index, the F FTSE 100 it's called, oh, oh, averaged over 31 days in August next year? Well, who knows? What will be the closing price on the first Monday in August next year? Let's do some engineering. Resonant frequency of a particular blade in a Rolls-Royce Trent 1000 engine's high pressure turbine assembly. Number of days in a given year that the wind speed at a proposed offshore wind farm site will exceed 25 meters per second. Serious questions for, uh, for engineers. But the point is that I'm uncertain about all of these things and I'm, the nature of my uncertainty is no different in any of these cases. Engineering uncertainties are not special. They're just uncertainties like any other uncertainties. Sometimes they're a lot uncertain. Sometimes they're not so uncertain. But that's the first point I want to make about this, the, the title of this meeting. It's a virtual conference on epistemic uncertainty, maybe. But in engineering, you wouldn't invite me if it was a, a meeting in which engineering uncertainties were so important because I don't really know anything special about engineering uncertainties. So can we delete those last two words of the title? So still lots of things I'm uncertain about, but what's the nature of their uncertainty? Well, the cesium one, I think you would call this a pure epistemic uncertainty. There, there's nothing random in there. It, it's a number. It's just, I don't know what it is. And so my uncertainty is due to lack of knowledge. Whether it's gonna rain here tomorrow, now you might think of that as a random event. There's some aleatory element to it. But on the other hand, it's not something I can't learn about. I can get a weather forecast. Um, so information will be gathered. There's a, there's a randomness in there, but I can reduce that randomness by learning more. So is that aleatory? Is it epistemic? I think it's got a bit of both in there. Dropping that drawing pin. If I knew how often in, on the, in the long run it would fall head up, then that would become a purely aleatory thing. But it isn't because I don't know how often it will fall head up on average. So there's an epistemic element there as well. In fact, anything that you, you're actually interested in that is an uncertainty that actually matters to you in engineering, perhaps in, in anywhere else, is going to be like this. It's gonna have at least some component of epistemic uncertainty. Even if there's randomness in there, you don't know the nature of the random process in detail. That's epistemic uncertainty. So there's always epistemic uncertainty. All uncertainties in practice are intrinsically at some level epistemic. So let's delete another word from the title. Let's call it a virtual conference on uncertainty because that might be what it's about. 
so I'm going to be slightly less uh, controversial and contentious uh, from now on, perhaps. I'm going to talk about probability. Again, there are these lots of things I'm uncertain about, and I can quantify all of those uncertainties using probability. So for instance, about this drawing pin, if I think it's more likely to fall head up and head down, I'm going to give a probability of more than a half. If I think it's less likely than that would be to draw a red ball from a bag containing six red and four white, well, that's a reference probability of 0.6. If it's less likely than that, the probability is less than 0.6 and so on. I could quantify any of these uncertainties using probability. Probability works for everything. We'll talk about imprecision later. Okay, I'm, I'm well aware that I can't do this to ar arbitrary precision, but I can do it at least in principle for any uncertainty I care to be interested about. Now, of course, I can quantify them using probability, uh, and that probability is going to be my probability. It won't necessarily be your probability. We have to acknowledge that probabilities are going to be subjective. And wherever we're talking about epistemic uncertainties, it has to be that way. Because epistemic uncertainties are a property of how much knowledge you have. And if you have different knowledge from me, then your probabilities will be different from mine. There's no escaping this. When you're using pro probability, talking about epistemic uncertainties, which is in effect all uncertainties that matter, then we're gonna have to use subjective probability. Frequency probability is fine if something is purely aleatory. And if we've got a component of aleatory in there, we can, if you like, use a frequency probability in there. But frequency and subjective probabilities are on a different basis. And if we're going to combine them, then we really need them to be on the same footing. And that works with subjective probability because it, A, it covers all uncertainties, but B, it is consistent with frequency for aleatory uncertainties. This is Definetti's theorem. So subjective probabilities work for all kinds and they don't disagree with aleatory frequencies, frequency probabilities. It's just that you never know what those are. So there's always uncertainty around them. And since all uncertainties of interest are epistemic, we have to use subjective probability. To imagine otherwise is to bury your head in the sand. Don't try and do it any other way. It doesn't make sense. Any objections to that? Am I being a little bit too contentious again? Surely some people say this is totally unscientific, this subjective probability thing. It's a common reaction, and particularly from scientists who are brought up to think that science has to be objective. Engineers tend to think of themselves as sort of like scientists. I've heard it characterized, they're sort of scientists who'd like to be scientists, but sort of failed along the way somehow, but that's unkind, it's not true. But they are often also of this opinion that science ought to be objective. And it's a fiction, it's a myth. If you think this, then you need education. So here we're gonna have an education experience. On the left, we have a skeptical, serious scientist. And on the right, we have a friendly person who's gonna answer the queries. I'm sorry for the gender stereotyping. These just happen to be nice pictures I found on the internet that seem to fit. So our serious, skeptical scientist says, you want to use subjective probability judgments. Isn't that totally unscientific? Science is supposed to be objective. And our friendly respondent says, yes, objectivity is the goal of science. But scientists still have to make judgments. They do all the time. They include theories they propose, insights they have, interpretations of the data. The data themselves may be objective numbers. But how you use them, what you take them to mean, is a matter of subjective judgment. Science progresses by other scientists debating and testing those judgments. That's how science works. Science strives towards objectivity through this process of peer review, debate, and gradual consensus of emerging. But a key point here is that making good judgments is what distinguishes a top scientist. They get there by making better judgments. The evidence is the same for everybody. The data is the same for everybody. 
if all scientists were equally good and judgment and skill and personal abilities played no role, then they'd all be top scientists. There'd be no one scientist better than another. What makes a good scientist is by being a better subjectivist. And when I hear scientists objecting to, to using subjective probability, I say to them, well, you're, you've been brought here as a top scientist because we want to hear your opinion. But if you don't want to give it, then just resign. Give up your nice big salary and let somebody else take it because you don't deserve it if you're not prepared to admit to what it is that makes you able to take the position you have. But wait a minute. Subjective judgments are open to bias and prejudice and sloppy thinking and wishful thinking and all that sort of stuff. What do you say to that? Well, yeah, they're judgments. This is an inevitable feature of personal subjective judgments. Human beings make mistakes, but they should be careful, honest, informed judgments. That's what science tells us we need to do. We be as objective as possible. And that's why we put our opinions and our judgments out there for other people to debate, criticize, disagree with. Probability judgments are like any other judgment that a scientist necessarily makes. And we need to argue for them in the same careful, honest and informed way. We have to try and avoid bias, prejudice, sloppy thinking. It is difficult. We're all aware that unconscious biases are affecting a lot of things that we do from day to day. We need to be trying to all the time to be conscious of what the biases are out there and how we can avoid them. So, subjective probability, have to use it. What's the problem then? I can quantify all these uncertainties using probability, but there is a limit to how precisely I can measure my probability, as I mentioned before. I can do this process with the drawing pin, but am I going to be able to get to the point where I can say uh, it's more likely than drawing a red ball from a bag containing 573 red balls and 427 white, but it's less likely than drawing a red ball from a bag containing 524 red balls and 426 white. I can't get that kind of precision. I can't make judgments to that kind of accuracy. Nowhere near. We have to talk about imprecision. Probability measurement. I wrote a book, my first book I wrote, published in 1988, so it's a while back now. I don't regret anything in it. I wrote this book called Probability Methods and Measurement. And the objective of this book was to say, here's, a, here's probability theory from the point of view of somebody who actually asks where the probabilities come from. In the preface of the book, I say something like, um, all students who are learning probability and are given probability tests and exams, the questions are of two kinds. Here are some probabilities, deduce this one. Or here are some questions concerning nice things like dice or cards or, or tossing coins, give me the probabilities. So they're either situations in which you're supposed to know what the probabilities are or they're given to you, but where do they come from in practice? So when I quantify my probability for an event, I get what I call a measured value and I could measure it several different ways. So I could end up with several different measured values for the same probability, the same event. In the same way, if I measure the length of my living room, I could measure it different ways. I could measure it by eye and say, oh, it's about four or five meters. Or I could say, uh, get a tape measure. My tape measure isn't quite that long, so I have to do it in bits. Or I could get one of these wonderful things that surveyors come along with, a laser measure, I'll stick it at one end and it will tell me how long the room is. Different types of measurement come with different degrees of accuracy. We should always strive towards the most accurate, where it matters. And, and we're only doing this whole exercise, having this conference, because some probabilities really matter in engineering as in other fields. So where they do, we need to do it as well as we can. 
So in the book, I say measurements are approximations to a true value. My true probability is the value that I would give if I were capable of making these arbitrary fine judgments about balls with 400 and 500 and whatever I said, 573 and 574 red balls. I could make arbitrary fine distinctions like that, taking full account of all the knowledge and theory that's available to me out there. So that my, my brain is functioning perfectly. I'm some kind of super me. I call myself super me. Or the person who's making the judgments is super you in the book. That's my true probability. It's an ideal. It's an abstraction. It doesn't exist. But it's useful. It's something I know what it, what it would look like if it could be achieved. So I know what I'm striving for when I'm seeking better measurements. Like the true length of my living room, there's, no, there's an ideal as well. The, the, the length is going to differ as I move across the, the width of it. But more than that, if you get down to the molecular level, it's impossible to define what the, exactly the, the length of my living room is. But it doesn't matter when I'm using a tape measure or a, a laser measure. I'm measuring to an accuracy that matters of something that's an idealized but useful abstraction. So people talk about true probabilities and they say, oh, that's, that's a nonsense, they don't exist. But they exist enough to make it worthwhile to think about them and to decide whether you're doing something which gets you towards that, helps you to make finer judgments, helps you to take better account of the knowledge and theory that's available to you. So in the book, we talked about how to make more accurate probability measurements. So I give an example like this. Suppose I toss a fair coin five times I'm interested in the probability of getting exactly three heads. So I just think about it. You know, is it more or less likely that I get three heads or not? I think it's probably less likely because there's several other possibilities. How much less likely? Well, it's probably, I don't know, it's a, somewhere of the order of a third. I, I'll, I'll say 0.35, okay? And that's, that's what I call direct measurement. When you just think and you compare the event you're interested with in with other standard events like balls in the bag, like to coin tosses are themselves a standard event where probabilities are known, okay? Even though the fair coin is just another uh, idealization, just like the inextensible string and frictionless table that we used to play with in, in our applied mathematics at school. But if I apply the binomial distribution to this, I get a probability of 0.3125. Now, what have I done? I've made some judgments. I've made some judgments that this coin is fair in the sense that heads is equally likely to tails on any single toss. And I've made another judgment that the to tosses are independent. OK, then I get 0.3125. This is a more precise measurement given the judgments I've made. And those judgments were much easier to make than my direct measurement judgments. So elaboration is the process of expressing a probability that's hard to measure directly in terms of others that are easier to measure. And I call it elaboration because somebody asked me, where do I get the 0.3125 from? I would elaborate, I would explain, I would say, well, this is where it comes from. It comes from these judgments and this way of putting them together. Every theorem in probability theory is potentially an elaborative measurement device. In fact, I'd say it's his only purpose. The only purpose of probability theory is to supply us with theorems that allow us to measure things more accurately. A wonderful example of this is Bayes' theorem. If I try to think about what I believe about something, where I've got some hard data and I've also got some other knowledge and experience, how do I put all those things together? Bayes' theorem tells me how to separate them. It tells me how to talk in terms of the likelihood, which refers to the data specifically, and how to talk about my prior distribution, which is the other information I have, and then how to put them together. That's what Bayes' theorem is. It's an elaborative measurement device. I don't have to use it. I can directly measure my posterior probability for something. And indeed, I would do that if the data were so surprising that I started doubting my my uh, likelihood and my model. So that's what probability theories are for. That's what 
is a tool for getting better, more accurate measurement. Express the thing you're interested in, in terms of things that are easier to think about and measure. So if we now change the fair coin to the drawing pin and we say up, U is the event of three head ups. Okay. Now I can split my aleatory and my epistemic parts. Given a long run frequency theta of head up, I would now through, again, through uh, Definetti's theorem, I would say the probability of getting three out of 10 out of five tosses is 10, which is 5c2, 5c3 times theta cubed times one minus theta squared. But that's conditional on theta. I now combine with my probability distribution for theta, which has to be an epistemic one, which I have to think about and make some other judgments about. And then I'd be able to get this probability. And that may be more accurate than simply direct assessment because it allows for the learning that happens as I throw a sequence of five tosses. But yeah, how am I gonna get that probability distribution for theta accurately? Elaboration doesn't help me anymore at this point, at least not the kind of elaboration that was mentioned in that book. So then we go on to elicitation. This is what I call the state of the art in probability measurement. Accurate measurement of uncertainties is often an important input to serious decision making. Wherever that decision making has substantial consequences, we need to measure these probabilities accurately. So what is the best measurement process? It's expert knowledge elicitation. You ask experts, you draft in experts who know about this thing you're interested in. Use more than one if you can, because that way you get a broader range of opinion, you get more information, you get more knowledge brought into the process. Break the problem down using elaboration if possible. Use elaborations that the experts find helpful to break down the problem into things that they find convenient nuggets to work on. Assemble all the evidence, get all the evidence that's available because people forget. There's well-known heuristics in, in, in probability judgment, in psychological research that say people make snap judgments. They don't use all the information that's available. So another way of getting better measurement is to think more slowly, carefully, and remember all the evidence that's out there. So one way to do this is to actually get the evidence assembled, do some literature reviews, search out what's out there, ask the experts themselves to supply more evidence, any hard evidence, even quite soft evidence can be useful when there's nothing really hard out there. And let's face it, when we're asking hard questions about judgment probabilities, very often we're doing it because there isn't a lot of good evidence out there. And the next thing is very important, use a skilled facilitator, somebody who knows how to manage these processes and use a process that is a state-of-the-art elicitation protocol. If you really care about getting these problems properly, this is what you do. Even when there is some data out there. So for instance, I work with pharmaceutical companies who have data from small trials, and they're looking to say to themselves, is it worth now going and setting up a big trial for this product, for this drug? And if so, how should I do it? In order to do that, they need to judge what are the chances of success on this? How good an effect are they gonna get on this drug? And they only have a small amount of evidence. So we convene a group to talk through that evidence, to think about how it relates to the question you're interested in. So for instance, they'll have a phase two trial but they're thinking about planning a phase three trial and the phase three trial will, will be a different kind of patient, quite possibly a different formulation of the drug, quite possibly a different dosage, run under different conditions. A lot of things will change, but they've got to use the evidence they have got and then ask themselves, the thing I'm interested in, how different will that be from what the data are telling me? All requires judgment. And it requires somebody 
good to help them manage that process of reaching that, that judgment. So we're going to be subjective, but we're going to be as scientific as we possibly can, as objective as we possibly can. So this is the, the process, the protocol that I use is called SHELF. It stands for the Sheffield Elicitation Framework. The, the, what you can get from SHELF is a, a freely available package of documents and simple software to help with elicitation. It's not software that does it for you. Press a few buttons and click and you get the answers. We are talking about a process of scientific judgment. So we, we, we can't just press buttons, but there are buttons to press to help you. So there's general advice on conducting elicitations, particularly using the shelf protocol and reasons why we say do it that way. There are templates for recording the elicitation. We have a number of basic methods within the shelf package and there's templates for all of these. Annotated versions of those templates with detailed guidance for the person who's running this, which is the facilitator, to help them to take their experts through this process and to record what happens. There are PowerPoint slide sets to help the experts to make the kinds of judgments that they're being asked to make. And then finally, there's a package of R functions, fitting distributions and providing feedback. So that's the shelf system in a nutshell. The elements of it, that, and particularly some of these that are characteristic of shelf as opposed to other elicitation protocols. The first three are about preparation, getting your evidence dossier together. I've talked about that. Selecting the right experts to use and the right number of experts. Training those experts so that you get the best out of them. Then what happens in the actual elicitation workshop we gather the experts together in shelf. We use a face-to-face a, a -face process. These days it's face-to-face -face online, but you can still have people looking at each other's expressions, talking to each other online. It's better if they're actually in the same room, but we can't do that these days, but we can still do elicitation. We get the experts together. They all make individual judgments about what you're interested in, and they do that privately. That way we get a snapshot of where they're coming from at the start of the meeting. They're then all revealed, all those judgments are revealed and we have a group discussion. We talk about the judgments that people are making and why with an objective of trying to resolve the differences of opinion between the experts, not in the sense necessarily of removing those differences, but at least of understanding them. And then we go into some of the final stage of group judgments. We ask the group as a whole to make judgments about the quantity we're interested in. And this is a consensus stage, but I'll tell you what kind of consensus in a minute. They make the group judgments. We fit a distribution to that. We discuss it. We make sure they're happy with it. And then that's the final answer. Another key component of SHELF is the, the templates that we have. They take you through the process in a sequence, a well thought through sequence, which relates to the psychology and other issues. And they also are process for documenting the, uh, the whole elicitation. That means that you now have a documented solution to your question originally, and people can check back and they can challenge it. That's science, okay? So here's this flow chart for what you have to do in the shelf process. And all except the last box there is pre-elicitation. It's preparation. You identify your experts. You allocate them to workshops to discuss all the quantities you're interested in. Going to the left, you invite the experts. You get their commitment. And commitment is terribly important here. You're going to be asking them to do a hard job, to think hard, to make difficult judgments, to put themselves on the line in a sense, although there is a confidentiality, there's, a, there's some uh, um, non-disclosure and so on happens in the way we do it. But you're asking them to do something difficult and to, to make judgments that you're, they're going to at least be judged on their judgments face to face with other experts in their field. So we do need commitment. 
And that means you've got to explain why you're doing it and why it's important. And then if people don't recognize that, there's no point in having them. Okay, once you've got them, you brief them. How do you brief them? Well, you've prepared your evidence dossier while this is going on. You send them that out. You send them also a statement about what the problem is and so on. And you also ask them to give you any ev additional evidence, which if you then get some, you can update the dossier. Meanwhile, you're setting up your venue or your Zoom meeting, but there's a training the experts process as well. And that can happen offline. That We've got, an, we've got a, a computer-based training course to teach experts to make the judgments you're gonna ask them to do. So they can simply log in and, and self-pace through that training course. When they've done all that, we go into the actual workshop. And then at the end of it, we complete our documentation and it's done. But there's a lot of preparation involved. Then in the workshop itself, what do we do? Well, first of all, we begin by reviewing everybody who's there and the purpose of the workshop, making sure everybody understands the roles that everybody's playing here. There are experts, but there's also a facilitator. That facilitator is also an expert. Not an expert in the subject matter, but an expert in elicitation. There's somebody who's recording, other people may be observing. All the roles are recorded and the purpose of the workshop, etc. <clears throat> Training, you review the online e-learning course, but also you'll do a practice elicitation. And one reason for that is the e-learning course can't teach them about the, the consensus part. And also you can't rely on them having learned everything perfectly. So you go back through things and make sure the learning is reinforced during the meeting. Review the evidence, always good. Make sure the evidence is fresh in people's minds. Otherwise it gets forgotten. Make sure that that evidence dossier is on the table all the time for people to look at, to refer to, and so that you can refer to it if they don't seem to be remembering it. Then for each quantity we're interested in, you follow a sequence of questions guided by the psychology and they make the individual judgments. Make judgments about the plausible range first, then the median, then things like quartiles or tertiles. They do these things according to the, the selected process. They then have a discussion. The individual judgments are revealed and discussed. And here's where managing the discussion is important because you've got to look, you've got to be aware of the personalities. You've got to make sure that people are not trying to dominate others, that other people aren't being too quiet. You need to make sure that everybody is listened to, everybody gets a chance to speak and is encouraged to speak. Okay. And then finally, we go into the group consensus judgments. And the key to this is this thing we call the rational impartial observer, or RIO for short. The idea is that even after discussion, we won't have resolved any conflicts and disagreements. We won't go out of this meeting with everybody thinking exactly the same. What we do want though, is we want to know what it would be reasonable to think. What would be reason for the client to think who asked for all of this, based on what we've got in front of us, which is the experts, their opinions and the data. So we ask the experts to think that there's this person called Rio, who's been watching everything that's going on, this rational, impartial observer. Rio knows enough to understand the discussion, but Rio's not an expert. Rio would give some weight to each of the experts' different opinions, maybe not the same weight. Rio would take his own or her own opinion out of this. What would Rio think, we ask the experts? What would it be reasonable for somebody to think about? They're not gonna necessarily agree with you personally, completely. They're gonna have some attention to what other opinions are. In a sense, we're asking what the community might think. There are other processes I've, I've come across where that is explicit. So for instance, there's some people that work in the area of seismic risks to nuclear installations. They have a massive complicated process, but in that, the notion of Rio is basically there. What would be the community opinion? You're asking the experts not to think of their, just their own opinion. You're asking them to represent the, the breadth of opinion and the community that's out there. And it turns out this nearly always can be done. 
it's it's the key to getting a consensus is to admit that you know don't all agree exactly what you, you think but you might come to some sensible opinion about what a rational impartial observer might think and that's what we need that's the person whose opinion really matters here because we don't want any individual expert opinion we want to know what is it reasonable to believe on the basis of the group and what they know of what's going on out in the community so we, that's what we fit a probability distribution to every step of this is guided and documented through the self, te self templates so finally let's talk about imprecision no measurement is perfect even the best elicitations imperfect of course we'll get different answers if we use different experts if we present the evidence differently write the dossier differently if we use a different facilitator even if we do this on a different day with the same people we will get different answers now if we've done this well they won't be so different they won't be very different but we've got to allow that there is some imprecision in there and so at the end of this process we always say to the client for instance be aware that this is not set in stone as the answer you have to now take this and make your own judgment from it you may disagree with some of the experts you may think that they missed something the experts themselves have already been asked if, if they felt they were they were missing some opinion that was important and that's been recorded so all of this leads around to ultimately a decision has to be made for what goes into the decision analysis that we're going on with and that's the client's job but we give them every possible help so how do we handle imprecision have we arrived now folks finally at the, the beloved imprecise probabilities have we got interval arithmetic well no no please no not quite so here are two things that i would say there is no point in trying to put hard bounds around an illicit pr listed probability. There's even less point in trying to put hard bounds around an illicit probability distribution. It's nonsense. There's no such firm edges. You have to admit imprecision in those and then we'll be in infinite regress. So just don't even think about it. And it's ridiculous to claim that all values within some interval of imprecision are equally plausible. No. The listed judgment, such as it is, is surely the best we've got. We may consider it as being put out a little bit one way, a little bit the other, but like any error distribution, it's more likely to be in the middle than at the edges. Even in the case of numbers that are clearly rounded, people say, oh, it's rounded to plus or minus 0 0.05. So we've got a, a uniform distribution uh, between plus or minus 0.25 of this, no. No, because there's always other imprecision in there. So here are my rules. Okay, I'm, I'm in charge of this talk, at least I'm in charge of this talk. Right, first, make a serious effort to minimize imprecision. Okay, use elaborations, use rigorous and careful elicitation, even if the only expert is yourself be guided by this process it helps you to think anything less than this is unscientific imprecision is inevitable but that's no excuse for not trying and if anybody says to you we can only say that this quantity lies between these two bounds that's not acceptable that is a cop-out if you get these people and they're prepared to do something worthwhile, they'll do better than that. The second rule is do sensitivity analysis. Of course, you get your measured probability, your measured distribution, but vary them in ways that reflect the imprecision that you judge to be there and see if your answers change in any material way. Now, I think this is going into decision making typically. Does it sit materially alter your decision? If they do, if varying those things a little bit changes the decision in an important way, then you have no answer and you can't go back and get a better answer. All you can say is the science, the evidence doesn't point me one way or the other. Then you've got to make your own choice. 
But if you followed the first rule and you have minimized imprecision, then you should only be varying by small amounts. This process will give you a reasonable degree of confidence in the answers. And when you only vary by small amounts, typically, and this is what we find fairly generally, the answers really don't change materially. Okay, given that we've made some judgments about where this quantity is likely to be and how, how much variability we could imagine in our, uh, to represent our uncertainty, given that more or less any fitted distribution will look pretty similar to more or less any other one, varying those numbers won't change things very much because you wouldn't need to vary them much. So you, you typically end up with a good answer, a fairly robust answer at the end of it. I'd say, to be fair, if tails of distributions matter, then you may be on a sticky wicket. It may be that you cannot elicit tails this way very efficiently. There are other techniques you need to use, things like fault trees and so on, to get into small probability areas. But generally speaking, this process works, and it works in engineering, it works in all the other sorts of areas I've worked in. I talked about pharmaceutical science, but it's also in environmental science, um, in uh, in law even, uh, and so on. All sorts of different areas, these things work. So here's some references briefly, just to end with. There's the, the Probability Methods and Measurement book. There's, the next one is a review book that was written, uh, eight authors. We, we had a project to review the literature. Now it's a bit old now, 2006, and a lot of the, the expertise in shelf is, is later than that, so shelf, the latest version was released in 2019, uh, version four. There's a lot of good advice in there, a lot of good stuff. Um, and as I say, whereas the review is very useful, um, there's a lot of things in there that were never mentioned in, the, in that review book. And then finally, it's a, a recent article I wrote. Uh, for, it appears in the, the American Statistician. Uh, it was actually coming from a meeting that the American Statistical Association organized to discuss uh, what we do about well, the p-values, basically. Um, they'd already said p-values are a bad idea from some previous workshop they held. And they, meant they were criticized for not saying what you should do. So they held a workshop to say what you should do. And part of it was uh, a session on expert judgment. So this article was written for that. But within it, it's worth reading because there's actually a, a, an extended case study of using shelf in a real problem in that in that article. So that's useful, I think. And that's the end of my talk. I now open to questions, I guess. Thanks, Tony, for a, a really fascinating talk. Um, I'd, I urge everyone to offer a virtual applause. Um, we have a bunch of questions in the chat that I can that I can read out to you. Um, and people are more than welcome to unmute their microphones and, and ask questions that way too. The first question that was uh, that was messaged was from Joshua Kaiser, um, who said, are there studies that show that expert elicitation is an accurate way to determine uncertainties, or is this something we do because we don't have any other choice? Well, how can you say what is an accurate way to determine uncertainties? Um, because you we could, don't know them. Well, well, a good example is you could find some, perform science, and then basically hide that from the experts, have the experts try to tell you what science says, and then see if that gives you the correct answer. I mean, I'm, I'm very familiar with expert elicitation when you don't have any other choice in the matter because you're asking questions that you, you don't know. But I'm also wondering, and I've always wondered, when you get a group of people in a room and they all agree on something, is there any studies that show that what they're agreeing on is more likely to be true than not true? Uh, it is a good question. And um, there are, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of published studies, but there are anecdotal instances where, where people have found the true answer. So for instance, 
Um, I, I recently did a dissertation in, in a pharmaceutical company and the issue was uh, what will be the performance of a particular drug in a phase three trial. Now, that phase three trial was actually already underway, um, but nobody in the, in the meeting knew the answers because the, all the data was still blinded. So they held this meeting um, as, a, as a test case to say, if we had done this beforehand, would we have learned something which changed the way we ran the trial? Um, and the elicitation was done. It showed that they, the experts together um, basically felt that there wasn't a great chance of this trial being successful. They, they thought that the, the drug would have a, a modest success, but not enough to justify going forward with uh, uh, marketing it, or even of getting approval for it from the regulators. And that is exactly what happened. That is exactly the outcome that came out. The trial was an expensive error, as many of these are, uh, and the, the drug performed more or less as the experts had said it would. I mean, obviously there's a range, there's a probability distribution, but it was well within their range of, of uh, of uncertainty uh, and that's that's the sort of thing that we see we don't often get to see the answers of course uh, many times i'm eliciting judgments about things that you'll never know the true value for um, and in this case they were they were essentially doing that so they were listing a belief about the true performance of this drug which you never see because you don't have an infinite trial but from their judgments just as we do combining my epistemic uncertainty about the drawing pin toss with the aleatory frequency issues, you can make a you can compute a distribution for what you expect the trial to produce, and that's what they did. So it's not a complete direct test of the elicitation, but it is a, a test of some implication of it. Um, so you can do these things, and I'm not aware of any major failures. But of course they can be. I mean, the experts can be completely wrong. There are many instances where, you know, all the scientists would say this is gonna happen and it doesn't. And you need to make sure that all your scientists, all your experts are su expressing sufficient uncertainty to allow for the, the, the unexpected. This is one of the things we do when we go through the workshop. We're asking them for their plausible bounds to begin with. And we, we try and push them on that try and make sure that they're thinking wide enough because the, un the unexpected happens. Now, the wildly unexpected can happen as well, but it shouldn't happen very often. So, so uh, I don't know of any serious quantitative answers on that, but the, what I've seen is, is encouraging. People often ask, how do you know your methods better than any other? And that is even more impossible to answer because you could never apply two elicitation methods to the same question in a, in a proper controlled trial way. Thank you. Um, can I just follow on from that, Francis? Um, yeah, so, of course you can. Just you so, have uh, eight minutes for the rest of the questions. Okay, I'll be very quick then. So, so I think some of Philip Tetlock's work is around verifying at least his kind of super forecaster judgment, which I think is, is kind of similar to your argument around the, the top scientist, I guess. Um, so I think he's done some stuff about verifying judgments, but that raises two questions that I don't think you addressed in your talk, Tony. I, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Philip Tetlock's work, um, but he's kind of, he's become popular recently in the UK. So the first one is, is the point that you made on precision. And one of the points that he makes is the people that he identifies as his sort of super forecasters have this kind of really good feel for the difference between like 54% and 50%. And, and they seem to have this appreciation that most of us don't share, even if we're numerate. So I wonder if, if you'd like to address that. And then the other, the other issue that he raises about the kind of problems that it's appropriate to ask for expert judgment on. And so he kind of says that it, it should have a, a clear time to, to the decision being made. So you put some time frame on it so that you can test whether that person has made a good judgment or not. And so I wonder if, if you'd like to comment about the type of people, if you agree with him, that there are certain people that are better at this kind of thing. If precision is important with those people and they do seem to have some appreciation of of, of different levels of precision. Um, 
And then finally, more generally, if you're aware of his work, what you think about him in, in a broader context. Okay, so I don't know the guy personally. I do know about super forecasting and other advocates of super forecasting. Um, it's a technique, uh, you know, it's, it's the wisdom of the crowds and so on, but it's also, it's, it's, it's a focused one where you, you select your crowd. Um, it's, it's suitable for some kinds of problems, and particularly the sorts of problems that they use it for are ones where um, there is evidence out there, um, there's a lot of general knowledge about the problem, and it's something that anybody can come in and quickly form an opinion on by scanning around that, in, that information. I I've never find myself in those problems. I find myself in, in serious technical questions where a knowledge of the field is, is really important. You've got to get people that know the field. Um, there may be people within that group that know the field who are better judges of probability than others. And that's very important. It, you can never know in advance and we never get the opportunity like the super forecasters do to, to test these people over many, many, many cases to find out how good they are. So we don't do that. Um, there are people, so there's another elicitation protocol, the Cook method, that he calls the classical method. Um, Roger Cooks does asks the experts to make lots of other judgments about things that he does know the answers to, and then he weights them according to how well they do on those questions he does know the answers to. Um, and what that typically results in is that many of these experts are simply weighted out. They, they get, get negligible weight because they've made some errors in their judgments on these seed questions. Um, I don't want to exclude people because their initial judgments aren't very good. When we do the process of discussion in, in shelf, what tends to happen is that poor initial judgments are exposed and the people, the other experts in the room talk them through it and, and the people realize they've if they've made poor judgments, they also realize the range of possibility out there and they get better. Well, that's the, the, the feeling I have is that we actually bring along and train up the poor judges to help us to make the right judgments at the end. Thanks, Tony. Um, I have another question from Alexander Wimbush. Alex, if you wanna unmute your microphone and read out your question, otherwise they can read out for you. Sorry, I was just finishing a piece of cheese and toast. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> uh, I think it's basically just asking the same thing from that. It was just like, how would you measure the efficacy of the elicitation? And you, like, how would you check whether or not the process has been working? Yeah, uh, that, it is essentially the same question. And, yeah, and yeah. You, you don't ever, get, well, it, it, you very rarely get any sort of strong feedback, Not in, certainly not enough to say whether it worked in that particular instance, because every instance is different, um, different questions, different experts, different problems to solve. And, and so, you know, I might say, well, that one didn't seem to work because it got an answer that wasn't quite what was expected when, or wasn't quite what you got when the, with the data, or, the, or even that the client said, well, how could they believe that? So you can sometimes get something like that, but what can you learn from that of a generic nature um, we don't have statistical evidence that allows us to do that. So a lot of elicitation practice is also subjective judgment. It's the judgment of the facilitator, the people running it. In my case, shelf is my judgment. It, with, together with Jeremy Oakley, who, who's, who's very important as a co-producer of shelf. Some of the most important ideas in shelf are from Jeremy rather than from me. So um, it's, it's a joint effort and um, between us, we do what we think on basis of our experience, and we're both practicing elicitation facilitators. Um, it seems to be the right way to go. And from our reading, of course. Yeah, but uh, would you say that's correct over something like statements that saying like a value would be within certain bounds, you can measurably demonstrate whether or not they hold to the uh, the frequentist probabilities that they claim well you, to be measuring against in principle this calibration idea is uh, you can you supposedly can test all the all the times that somebody says the probability of say 0.5 or say let's mess it something different point three they give a probability point three you collect together all the events that they give a probability point three to and you see how many of them actually happen 
And is it is it 30 percent or is it not? Uh, I'd like to be able to do that. I never I never can do that with a single expert because I never get that many judgments from them. I can never do that for a, a, a group because I only get one thing from any one group. And, and so much depends on on who uh, on the day uh, performs in different ways. I, I don't think I can, I'd like to. I mean, I have even proposed running experiments in which um, I, uh, so, so Roger Cook's method, let's get some seed variables. I'm not gonna use them. I'm just gonna use what the experts said in, in independent, independently initially. Roger will then weight them. I will then take the experts and have a separate meeting with them and come up with a consensus. And then we can ask how that compares with, with his weighting. We haven't done that. And, and one reason is you only ever want to, do, to take the time of serious people like Roger and myself and, and the people we work with, uh, which, take, which is expensive, and the time of experts, which can be even more expensive, uh, and run experiments like that, where one or the other ver arm of this experiment would give you an answer. Why would you pay twice? to get your answer. People don't. So the, the, the client needs persuading that it's worth him investing in an experiment that he's never going to benefit from. If we could get research councils or something like that to pay for it, that'd be great. But I'm afraid this is not the sort of stuff that any of our British research councils will fund. Thanks so much. Sorry to, to interrupt. There's been an absolute flood of questions in the chat, Tony, so maybe you'll get a chance to, to look at them later. Um, and respond. But Sorry, moment, I do answer to... at length, don't I? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem at all. I mean, they're all really interesting questions and, and answers. So thank you for your time. Um, so we're going to move on to, to Bill. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing a screen. Hopefully it goes smoothly. And Scott, if you'd like to introduce our, our next speaker, please. Sure. I, I can just say about uh, Bill Overkamp. Uh, he's a specialist in aerospace engineering. His bachelor's degree, which I never knew, was from Notre Dame. Notre Dame is spelled Notre Dame, but it's pronounced Notre Dame because it's in Indiana. Um, he also got his PhD there, uh, but spent some time at the University of Texas at Austin, where he was a professor for nine years, I guess. He also spent 30 years at Sandia National Laboratory in New Mexico uh, and uh, retired there recently as a distinguished member of the technical staff, which is a uh, a labby sort of a thing. It basically means distinguished professor. Um, he's been a consultant for NASA, the United States Air Force, the Department of Energy. Uh, he's, uh, the, he's a fellow at the AIAA, and he spends a lot of energy at NAFIMS, which used to stand for the National Agency for Finite Element Methods and Standards, but I guess it's just NAFIMS now. And I didn't realize this, but it's part of the uh, UK's National Engineering Library. So he's really, uh, he's virtually at Liverpool right now is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Bill, if you're ready. I think we're uh, pretty close here. Yep. Can you see that okay? Hear me all right? That's perfect. Okay. Uh, thanks very much to Scott and all of his colleagues at the Institute for Risk and Uncertainty. I appreciate the invitation to give this presentation and uh, it's always enjoyable to hear uh, Tony O'Hagan's perspective. He and I have debated uh, these kinds of issues uh, over a number of years. So I want to address some of the issues that uh, Tony had just talked about, but then move into more of a decision making from a computational simulation standpoint. Bill, you're getting a little bit. So of, I want to start off. You're getting a little bit of feedback. Are your, are your headphones still turned on? There's a little bit of feedback. Let me try uh, switching over to headset here. Can you, uh, that sound a little bit better? No change at all, but that's good. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> okay, let me 
let me uh, move back here. Well, hopefully the uh, hopefully the audio is a little bit better. I think it was getting a little bit of feedback from the uh, from the computer here. Anyway, I want to talk about uh, an example problem. Uh, the example problems I think are very instructive because they focus in on particular issues. And uh, as some of you may be aware, um, when I was at Sandia, we put together a number of what we call epistemic challenge problems and they were very effective. And uh, I think also helped the discussion through the years. I uh, also wanna talk about the family tree of uncertainty theories. Uh, Tony feels that uh, traditional probability is the uh, perfect answer. Well, I beg to differ. And we'll talk about uh, some of the other theories that are available. And I'll only uh, briefly mention a couple of different options. And then I want to switch gears, essentially move into decision making and practice uh, from a business perspective and also a regulatory perspective. And then talk about how do you build credibility mainly from the perspective of computational simulation. Tony was more stressing from the statistical side. This is more from physics-based simulation. And then I have one slide on some closing remarks. So I wanna start off with a uh, simple example problem to focus the issue on a, this very, very specific issue of epistemic uncertainty. And uh, suppose you have a very simple model and you could pick whatever kind of simple model. In the epistemic challenge problem years ago, we had, uh, it was a similar problem. Uh, I think we only had two or three uncertainties and uh, at least uh, independent variables X. So here we wanna talk about the response quantity is Y and whatever condition of interest X that you'd like. And then there are five uncertain input quantities. And for a reference point, uh, we wanna talk about a very poor state of knowledge of these five input uncertainties. So the first one is only a bound on the range of the element of each of the elements is known. As Tony said, uh, that doesn't uh, occur. We, we beg to differ. And, uh, but suppose in this example problem, try to put your mind around this example problem. Uh, the other one is no information is known about the likelihood over the range of each. You literally don't know anything about the likelihood. All you say is the, is the bounds. And furthermore, uh, you say you don't know anything about dependencies between these. These are, of course, epistemic uncertainties. They are due to lack of knowledge. And as Scott Fearson has said in various forums, he said, this is almost saying you don't know anything about these quantities. And that's a good description, but you do know something. And from this basis, um, you're trying to advise a decision maker. So if you say, what, what does this look like? So if you take some particular values for the intervals for these five uncertain quantities, um, can you, uh, can you see my pointer there okay? Hopefully you can. Yeah, we can see it fine. Um, okay. Uh, this is the exponent of the first term, uh, first polynomial term. This is the exponent of the second one. So it is basically a uh, polynomial with uh, order two and uh, all the coefficients and the exponents are uncertain. So this is what the system response says, given this amount of information. Uh, there is a minimum and a maximum at any value of X you're interested in. And we're we gonna be particularly interested in the value of 10. So given this poor state of knowledge, uh, the uncertain output ranges from nine to about 26 or 27. And you can compute this output a couple of different ways. One of them is you can use interval arithmetic and then uh, the way that we did it and most commonly done, you can divide each of the elements of theta into equally spaced samples. And then you propagate all of these combinations of possibilities through the model to yield this range. This one you can actually solve analytically, but uh, in general, that's what we're talking about here. So this is really a interval propagation uh, uncertain interval input produces, of course, an uncertain output interval. 
And there's really no debate to that. That's, that's the posed question. So uh, let's talk about how a traditional probabilist would address this kind of problem. Uh, by far the most common assumption is to assume that a uniform distribution over each interval. But this of course characterizes the state of no knowledge as randomness. And I think mm, Tony somewhat recognizes there's a difference between uh, knowledge and randomness. I, I think he recognizes that. He uses the term epistemic uncertainty, but sometimes I'm not sure if it really is knowledge. Uh, but uh, if you want to, if you want to uh, solve this problem, then the most common solution would be to put a uniform distribution over each interval. And what you're really saying is that even though I know nothing about it, I'm going to assume that it is a uniformly distributed random variable over a range. There, of course, is another way. You don't see it very much anymore. A number of years ago, people talked about this. But there's another way that a Bayesian might approach it, is you could talk about possible realizations of each of the elements of theta and propagate all of these possibilities. And the closest approach to that would be what's usually called robust Bayesian estimation. And uh, that has been, I, I think it's a very constructive approach, but uh, not many people, yeah, I personally hadn't seen it very much because it is more expensive than solving the problem multiple times. And uh, you can also say, well, why not just assume uh, an interval for each of these uncertain quantities? And my comment is, this is not gonna happen. And people may say, what do you mean it's not gonna happen? Let me say it a little bit more bluntly. If you say that these really are intervals, then it wrecks the machinery. The machinery has had a wrench thrown in it and you will not produce anything because it cannot deal with that level of uncertainty. Complete lack of knowledge, except for the range, that, that's unacceptable because you cannot produce an answer. Well, what's the other uh, response? And that's the one that uh, I think Tony explained uh, in his talk. You can say that this poor state of knowledge never exists in practice. And uh, he said, this is, I think his words were, this is an unacceptable response from an expert. So that's why I said, this is going to happen. And of course, that's exactly what does happen. So if you look at the response of this system, suppose you look at x equal to 10 to the uh, problem posed for the interval valued propagation, it produces a interval valued y. There's no one would debate that. That's, that's, not, that's not an issue, okay? And you would see that you would get this probability box, which you see here in red. Okay, so that quote, that is the true answer. I mean, there's, there's really no debate. The question is, does that really occur? And if you take the, by far the most common approach is if you take a uniform distribution uh, of all of the input uh, variables, you consider that they're random variables, you get this um, uh, black curve here, which is of course, a, it is a, uh, a CDF with that assumption that everything is characterized as a random variable. But in this probability box, I think most people are familiar with it, but, but maybe not. You say, if you've never seen one before, you say, I have no idea what this says. What it says is that all probabilities are possible within that range, okay? And as I said before, and I'll stress again, that is the answer to the problem, that there, there is no other information. So you would call that entirely epistemic uncertainty. So in the comments there on the left, the distribution, uh, a uniform distribution is actually a very strong statement of knowledge because it assumes equal likelihood over an interval. But none of the input data said that, okay? But if you wanna get an answer, you gotta, you gotta do this, okay? So you were forced into a very tight spot. It's an analogy of a square peg in a round hole. For intervals, the probability mass can be assigned to the entire interval. And of course, if you're familiar with evidence theory or dempster schafer theory, that's exactly, it'll, it'll come up with the same answer. So evidence theory can get this, you can solve this problem correctly. 
And when when uh, people like Tony and other traditional probabilists say that, that that's that on the one hand you can say that's not needed, and I say okay, well if you want to solve this problem, there, there you can't do it. Oh yes, you can. You can do it with evidence theory because what it does is it assigns the probability mass to the entire interval. It is not uniformly distributed. It is not specific values. It is into the entire set. So a couple of comments I'm repeating here because I, I uh, Tony said this a number of years ago and so I, 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 uh, I'll, I'll repeat it here. Uh, they contend that these never occur or as Tony said it just a few minutes ago, uh, this is an unacceptable for a uh, expert to give you this. And so I would say, well, does that mean that she's fired from the expert elicitation team because he's not following the rules and, and you, you could say different things about that. Uh, but Tony said probability is perfect, and, but we can't elicit it. So he, he really believes that the problem is an expert elicitation problem. He used the term, it is probability measurement, subjective probability measurement. And I'd say, well, I don't think it really is a measurement issue. It is really an issue of evidence or knowledge. And he contends that, of course, this, this is not allowed to happen. And the reason it's not allowed to happen is because it wrecks the machinery. And a number of years ago, Roger Cook made the comment in a paper, this is in response to the Sandia challenge problem. I suggest that reports of experts inability to give distributions reflect the attitude of the analyst not the experts. So at least some experts say, nope, this doesn't happen. And uh, we have become more convinced as a, a number of people uh, over the years, no, this actually does happen. The question is how do you deal with it? So another way to uh, put a good graphic, I think appropriate graphic on this is uh, when you have all of these uncertainties, you're gonna need a bigger rug. This, this, this is a problem, this just does not fit. And there actually is a bigger rug that we can have. And that is a family tree of uncertainty theories. And this is a graphic that uh, primarily came from uh, George Clear and Smith in, in uh, their book, but it also is uh, some of the later terminology that is in Augustine and others in their excellent book on imprecise probabilities. So this is the actual family tree you may not want to recognize uh, who all of your relatives are, but this, this, is, this is the whole set. And as you can see, classical probability sits down over in this box and interval analysis sits over in this box. And these are special cases or subsets of possibility theory and also Sagano measures or sometimes they're called lambda measures. And then there is a class of uh, methods where these come together. And they're, I've seen them recently called co-monotonic clouds, and they are bounds on sets of probabilities. So you move from precise probabilities to imprecise probabilities. And of course, probability bounds analysis sits in this box. Robust Bayesian estimation is actually a set of probability. And then also uh, in another book, it's called creedal sets. And that's another reasonable name. And then one above that is where Dempster Schaefer theory sits or evidence theory. And then there are other theories that have been invented that are more refined. They have more subtleties that can be expressed in different types of knowledge and conflict of knowledge. So this is the actual family tree, whether you want to look it up or whether you accept this family tree or not, that's up to you. But this is how everybody's related. And the world does not simply revolve around classical probability theory and interval analysis. There are actually many other larger sets. So now I wanna start talking about uh, decision-making and I wanna start off with decision-making in practice. And I wanna stress both decision-making in a business environment and also from a regulatory environment. So I put together this uh, graphic to point out, uh, particularly to uh, university students or researchers at universities these are the actual things that go into real life decision making in business. There's return on invest, investment, profit margin, what are the organizational goals, competition, uh, market segment, 
personal goals and value system. This all, people make decisions and everybody has a value system or their own personal goals. And those always interact. And then decision makers also uh, rely very heavily on their experience on the various options that are available. And then you have risk tolerance of potential reward for the decision because it is a trade-off and I'll talk about that here in a minute. And then the other is that's a real issue is familiar, familiarity or reliability of the information sources. These are all different kinds of things that go together in the mind of either a single decision maker or it could be a group. And then of course a decision is made and you get some decision result. Regulators, they have a little bit different type. They have some of these are similar, but they have some other issues. They have some other perspectives. First one is the top priority is to public safety and environmental safety as it should be. And that's exactly what they're entrusted with. And that is appropriate. They're very sensitive to making an incorrect decision. Okay, this, that they, that, that is a mistake they, pref they really try to avoid making. They're very risk averse with regard to an incorrect decision as opposed to making a decision which may have some adverse consequences, but they are quote, acceptable. And then there's of course the potential loss of political support for the regulatory function and on major failures of systems that clearly has happened. And we've seen it both in nuclear power and we've also seen it with the 737 MAX issue. And I'll refer back to that a little bit later. The other one is I think uh, people need to, especially researchers need to think about from a business perspective, uh, what is the value proposition of simulation? I'm specifically thinking about computational simulation. Uh, simulation from a business is actually a service. It's, some people say it's a product. No, I don't, I don't that's, not, that's not what business people say. It is a service in the sense that it produces an intangible good, okay? Intangible result. And that result is information or knowledge. And it's very much like in a expert opinion, okay? But this is a computational simulation, okay? But it is still information or knowledge. Uh, when it is acted on, it can produce a tangible good or a decision or a policy decision, okay? But what we actually produce in computational simulation is actually information. I think we need to remember that. And then based on that information, decisions are made. So for-profit businesses, the top issues, and literally they are in order here when, when, this is, uh, when these are surveyed, the reduced time to market for new improved products is always at the top of the list. Because uh, years ago, it used to be national competition and over uh, at least a number of decades, it has been international competition and people recognize that. And so when you have competitors from all over the world, uh, this is, this is the key issue, biggest reason for uh, investment in computational simulation. Reduced experimental testing of new or improved products. That of course is an important element because that is a very expensive and time consuming piece. Whether it's clinical testing or whether it's testing a system, an engineering system, it's still expensive and time consuming. And then of course, improved design optimization, performance, reliability and safety. And I think uh, when you're a university student or university researchers, you think that optimization of systems is the primary issue for businesses to move in computational simulation. It's actually not, it, it's a key element, but these first two are actually more important. When government organizations, uh, regulators, laboratories, centers, research uh, institutes, uh, they have a little bit different value proposition improved uh, products, uh, public or environmental safety, improved military capability or national security, research and development of development. Sometimes they call them prototype or one of a kind development activities. And then of course, academic organizations, they use computational simulation to generate new scientific knowledge. And of course, discoveries for improved economic or social goals. What about the simulation value versus risk for business? Uh, I want to try to give a little bit broader perspective than most, I think, researchers uh, at universities uh, usually have. 
business always looks at both sides of a decision. It is never just risk. It is also benefit. Sometimes these benefits are quantified. Sometimes they're not very well quantified. So business will only take a risk if the perceived risk, and, it, and the risk can be an expenditure. Okay? It's a decision, but suppose it's an investment. It can be an investment in a stock or it can be investment in developing a new product is less than the perceived benefit, okay? The benefit must outweigh the perceived risk. For example, investment simulation, uh, investment in simulation versus reduced time to market. These are, these are issues that businesses are struggling with now. And a lot of businesses have been moving in the direction of increasing their computational simulation. And the top one, of course, is reduced time to market. Investment in simulation also to increase the profit margin. Uh, when you talk about risk analysis, it really addresses one side of the decision, which is fine, but you need to realize the other side is the benefit side. Risk is traditionally uh, defined as probability of occurrence versus a negative outcome. So it just appears, it stresses one side of the coin. However, there are some important subtleties, and I think over the last 10 years, uh, maybe 15, but particularly the last 10 years, the difficulty of estimating risk as opposed to probability, people are realizing with some major failures. Uh, for example, you can either say uh, Chernobyl or you could say Three Mile Island. The, the, the impact was much, much greater than anybody ever realized, okay? And that, that is the negative outcome part of it was underestimated. So a couple of problems is, of course, probabilities of rare events are very difficult to estimate because you literally have no data, okay? And that's, of course, an epistemic uncertainty. Negative outcomes can also be very difficult to identify or to quantify. It can have unintended consequences that people never even thought they would have um, or impact that they would have. And one example that's, of course, still in the news is the uh, 737 MAX decision. And that was a failure mode. Everybody understood that that failure mode what could happen. It wasn't an unknown, unknown. No, 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 that failure mode was, was identified. But because of the benefits that were deemed by Boeing management, they decided that they were gonna take that risk. And then the other issue here, decisions are always on a individual perspective. So you could say a group, but in business, someone is always in charge and makes the final decision. And one of the things that organizations need to pay attention to is how does the individual perspective or value system fit with the organizational perspective? These, of course, are difficult issues that uh, people in the business world are interested in looking at. When you look at simulation value for risk versus risk for regulators, as I've stressed a little bit before, but I want to stress again, they view the world, they, they, they view the decision differently. Regulators tend to strongly focus on the potential risk as opposed to the potential benefit or improved efficiency, or in drug testing, it's called the efficacy. So for example, in the COVID vaccine, the, the risk of potential side effects on certain populations, this is a very big issue, even though, it could be very effective. They have to also weigh what are the potential side effects because uh, I like to use the expression, if there are significant side effects, they are gonna be beat up about this and the politicians will be the first one to beat them up because they approve this. So they're in a very difficult spot. So for pers the personal reward system in government services is highly asymmetric favoring. I call it no mistakes as opposed to possible benefit or possible improved in efficiency or efficacy. Negative consequences far outweigh the positive outcomes. Okay, that, that, is, that is their value system and there's a good reason for it. If you look at it from a management perspective, uh, management at regulatory agencies, they have to deal with pressure from politicians, industry, special interest groups. They must deal with these things and they, and they do. Okay, sometimes they do it well, sometimes they don't do it well overly cautious regulatory staff. This is a real issue, and how does management deal with it? This, of course, is an internal issue, never makes the press, but they, they understand these kinds of things. 
And then another one that we have found over the last number of years, as computational simulation has improved and it's becoming more dominant, how do you motivate and train management and staff to assess credibility of computation simulation? One of the quotes I like to quote, a number of years ago, a US Nuclear Regulatory Commission fellow flatly told me, he said, over my dead body, will I accept the CFD simulation in a safety decision? And he meant it. He probably still feels that way today. In fact, most of them do. Because of the lack of credibility in the simulation, Wanted to put this slide up. You don't see this kind of thing very often. These are failures in systems. These are high visibility failures where modeling simulation played a significant role. Everyone on modeling simulation was in the decision-making process. And this 737 MAX, uh, of course, we had two uh, fatalities, two, two uh, failures of systems, uh, roughly 300 uh, people killed in that. And uh, of course, the Fukushima Daiichi accident. All of these things, some you may be familiar with, uh, but these things people need to recognize. How do we learn from them? And this last one I'll point out, hardly anybody, if you talk to engineers, even civil engineers, they'll say, what do you, what? I've never heard of this Bunkyo Dam failure. It occurred in 75 in China and Henan province. Uh, after that dam failed, 62 other dams below uh, downstream failed, and there were the deck, deck, it's the largest engineering failure in history. And it anywhere from 20 to 50,000 people died directly from that. And then uh, between anywhere from 200,000 to 300,000 died because of famine and all of the catastrophe afterwards. But you hardly ever hear about that. But I contend that we need to understand how these systems fail. Was it a computational simulation failure or was it poor decision making? Or how, how do all of these things happen? So now I want to start talking about specifically on computational simulation. This is a uh, diagram that uh, I had never quite seen, seen it put, this, put together like this. Chris Roy and I have been uh, showing it this way. We have it in our book. And uh, it's, it's a higher level perspective uh, than what most people, you know, people understand this, but I, I think it displays very nicely what the issues are. You have the environment of interest and uh, environments are typically come in three general categories, normal operating environment, abnormal, or you could say um, accident environment, and then a hostile environment. And don't have time to go into those, but those are the three typical ones three general categories. And then each of those have scenarios. And of course, nuclear power safety have been thinking about this for 30, 40 years, 50 years. And then if you say you have some computational model and you have uncertain input quantities, they're generally into these five categories that you see there on the left. And those uncertainties are propagated as a long vector X propagated through the model F of X and uh, of course, you also have a model there, which is the propagating engine. And then you have a system of uh, response quantities, uncertain response quantities, why? Non-deterministic simulation in the past has traditionally focused on propagation of input uncertainties to obtain output uncertainty. That's where the emphasis has been for a long time. And of course, representation of all uncertainties as random variables, as Tony just talked about. And then Bayesian calibration has been a uh, very uh, active area for a long time. It's a very constructive way to factor in new data. So the elements of credibility in computational simulation, I summarize here, general areas, topics of verification, validation, uncertainty quantification. And these are the issues that computational simulation rely on for all of the elements that build credibility on and, and how a decision maker should be more aware of these. Of course, I don't have time to go into all of these, but code verification, which is essentially testing the software and the algorithm. Solution verification is numerical error estimation. Model validation is how well does the model perform where you have experimental data, okay? And you may have very little. In fact, you may have none for the real system of interest at the conditions of interest. And then you have model calibration is always a very important piece. 
And then you have this piece, which is now getting more and more visibility of physics-based model extrapolation, where you have no data for the system, uh, at either at the conditions it could be in the future or the conditions of interest. And that's being better recognized. And uh, because that this is all really about prediction. And then of course, the characterization of all of these uncertainties. Code verification and model validation are really assessment activities. They're accuracy assessment activities. And validation is where you have data. Solution verification, uncertainty quantification, they're really, you could say estimation or characterization issues, okay? And th that's a different kind of thing. And then VVUQ should be focused forthrightly on informing decision maker, because as I stressed in earlier slides, Modeling simulation, computational simulation, it is an information source which is now being heavily relied on, not only by business decision makers, but also regulators. So if you start saying, where do these uncertainties come from? When you start putting them all together, the list is longer than most people care to recognize or have been informed about. There's uncertainty, of course, in the input parameters, and these can either be model input parameters or they can be also numerical. And the one that, as I said, has been focused on is the input parameters. And when I say input data parameters, these are independently measurable. And then there are some input parameters that are not directly measurable. They must be inferred with an inverse process like Bayesian estimation. And that's fully appropriate, okay? Uh, uncertainty modeling parameters, these are the parameters, for example, of a distribution. Uh, and these, some people want to say they're part of the input parameters. I think they're actually separate. You can define a family, but not know the uh, parameters. And then, of course, you have numerical algorithm parameters like numerical damping and, and solid mechanics, fluid mechanics. You, you always have these parameters are essentially uh, control parameters for the algorithms. And then there's a set of numerical solution errors. There's iterative solution errors because we always have iterative procedures because we solve nonlinear problems. Spatial and temporal discretization error can be also in any other independent variable like frequency. And then there's sampling errors from the simulation, not this separate from the, from the experimental data. And then of course, essentially nobody, especially Bayesians, they can't live without a response surface because it's, they need so many samples and so they construct response surfaces. And that's a technology that is pretty well developed, but what is the error in the response surface? I hardly ever see that actually addressed, but it is actually a numerical error. It's not, it's not a physics error, it's a, it's a numerical approximation error. And then of course the last one is model form uncertainty. And uh, this one, uh, and, and I, I think just about everybody would agree, starting what 20 years ago with uh, Kennedy and O'Hagan's uh, paper on Bayesian calibration for model form uncertainty and identifying what's called what they call the model discrepancy term, uh, that, that was a huge step forward because it's not any of these others. It is this one. It is model form uncertainty. And it is in, in the uh, Kennedy and O'Hagan procedure, of course, it solves the inverse problem to infer based on the data and what the characteristics of the input data are, what that model, it's a bias error is what it is. Okay, and then of course, estimation and the application conditions of interest is much more difficult, this model form uncertainty, because it actually involves extrapolation. And this is being stressed more and more in recognition that where we have data is actually relatively rare compared to where we actually, where we have that, where we want to apply the model for decisions, we actually don't have any data there. Some researchers, of course, over the last two decades have started using imprecise probabilities because as I'll talk about here in a minute, a lot of these are epistemic uncertainties or you could say bias errors, they're, they're not random variables, okay? And that of course has been one of the difficulties in numerical solution error, uh, that, that's a good example to talk about. And I think people are better recognizing that these can be uh, significant when you talk about complex numerical simulations, because uh, we now are solving extremely complicated physics problems, but uh, 
none of these are random errors. So if you start saying, how, do you, how would you sort these between purely aleatory, purely epistemic, and when I say purely epistemic, what I mean is it's an interval value quantity. It only has a balance, nothing else. And then there are mixtures, okay? Mixture of aleatory and epistemic. Input parameters, they are typically a mixture of model input parameters. And of course, unless uh, Tony gets a hold of them, then they're going to be all aleatory uncertainties because he doesn't allow any sort of mixture. It's got to be some sort of precise distribution. And then uncertainty modeling parameters, those are parameters in the modeling of the uncertainty itself. I mentioned those. And then, of course, numerical algorithm parameters, these are all epistemic uncertainties. And then numerical solution uh, errors, iterative solution and discretization error, these are epistemic and they're, they're bias errors, okay? Because when solutions converge, they converge from one side to the other. In very coarse meshes or very poor iterative solutions, th they look random, but they're actually uh, bias errors. And then of course, statistical sampling uncertainty, it's actually a mixture. It's a combination of both random error and also epistemic Sa sampling, of course, is an epistemic, but we have, it's a very well-behaved uh, aleatory uncertainty. And response surface uncertainty, of course, is a mixture of both bias and random. And model form uncertainty, it is a epistemic uncertainty. You can represent it as a model, as a, a mixture, but it actually, is an epistemic uncertainty. It is the imperfections and the assumptions and approximations in the model. So some ideas on how you can put these together. I just give two examples here for people, particularly people who are not familiar with what imprecise probability results produce. And these are for uh, two very different examples. I took this first one here on the left from uh, John Hilton's paper that we put that a uh, number of us put together years ago for the epistemic uncertainty challenge problem. This is the uh, oscillation of a mass spring damper problem that we specifically describe, and it is a this D is uh, it is the ratio of the steady state amplitude to or the predicted unsteady am amplitude predicted steady state amplitude compared to the steady state amplitude. And we had significant epistemic uncertainties in this uh, model problem. And um, uh, this is one solution that we use. This is the outer bounds that you see there is with evidence theory. This is the belief. This is, of course, the exceedance probability for the belief function and the plausibility function. And these, these two are a precise representation of the state of knowledge that was given in the problem. It's not an approximation, it's exactly what was there. But if you then go in and show what is the result if you put a uniform distribution, if you say this lack of knowledge is actually, it's gonna wreck the machinery and if we're gonna produce a result, we've got, we've got to do something. So if you put a uniform distribution on it, this is a uniform distribution put on all of these interval valued quantities in the problem. And so you could say, uh, suppose you showed this, suppose you had just this one, which is the, of course the traditional way to do it, called precise probability by, by saying all lack of knowledge is random, which of course is not true, but that's, that's the assumption. This is what the decision maker would see, okay? And they'd say, well, what's the exceedance probability? Well, this is, this is a precise distribution given the assumptions that we made. You could say whatever elicitation process, whatever it is, but this one is with uniform. But the actual uncertainty, given the original uncertainty state in the problem, this is actually the range of uncertainty. And of course, some people like Tony might say, well, it ranges from zero to one. You didn't tell me anything. And I'd say, yep, that's exactly right. And we, uh, we have taken the uh, approach that if you cannot be informative to the decision maker without these additional assumptions, this is the state of knowledge. Now, if you want to go and assume something about characterization of intervals as a random variable, then you can do more. But this is the state of knowledge that actually exists. 
This is the problem that Chris Roy and Michael Balch had put together some years ago. This is on a uh, engine problem. And uh, the thing we're talking about here, th th this doesn't have any numerical errors in it. This one does. This has both the model input uncertainties, which is a mixture of both aleatory and epistemic, and then adding in the model form uncertainty. And then on top of that is the numerical uncertainty. And of course, the purpose in this is to show these are actual additional, all additional contributions to uncertainty. And it, this is how it is, it is decreasing the evidence that you have for what the simulation produces. And you can say, well, this isn't a pretty picture. And our argument is, no, it's not pretty, but this is, this is the situation that we believe decision makers should be informed about. So if you start looking at all of these issues of verification, validation, and uncertainty quantification and assumptions that are made, you might really be a surprise what is actually under the hood. And, but as we move in the future toward more modeling simulation based decision making, simulation informed decision making, uh, managers uh, and uh, also decision makers, they need to ask a lot tougher questions about all of these different contributors because the picture may not be pretty, but, but decision makers, they can deal with uncertainty. So a few closing remarks. Epistemic uncertainties exist in model input data, numerical solution uncertainty, and model form. These are all, uh, some of them specifically solution and model form, these are bias errors, okay? You can try to characterize them as a mixture, but they are a bias error. And we have to try to better recognize them. Elator and epistemic uncertainties are fundamentally different, but only imprecise probability theories treat them differently. And the reason they're able to do that is because you could represent poor states of knowledge exactly. You don't have to put the square peg into the round hole. Perspective decision makers regarding experiment and simulation. Uh, of course, uh, students and researchers at universities, very much emphasis on modeling simulation, that's great. But you have to understand the decision makers perspective. And this is both business and regulatory, even more so in regulatory. An expression that was used by a friend of mine at Sandia, experiment is full reality partially revealed. I think that's a beautiful statement. Simulation is approximate, approximate reality fully revealed. We know a great deal about the details of this, but it may of course be actually completely bogus. It doesn't represent reality. Predictive capability focuses on what has never been seen before. And we need to recognize that when we extrapolate beyond where we have data or into the future, for example, on climate change or any other, any other issue that business is dealing with, the, these, are, these are extrapolation issues. And they have to be based on physics as best we understand it and best recognizing the uncertainties of the physics and not statistics. Statistics won't get you there because statistics doesn't extrapolate, physics does, okay? Doesn't do it perfectly, but it does. And we have to, we argue, try to attempt to estimate the total uncertainty and show the decision maker. Some people feel that if you give a decision maker a very, a very wide range, suppose it's zero to one probability, they say, you didn't tell me anything, I'd say, yeah. But now let's talk about a sensitivity analysis and say, what are the big contributors to this? And that of course is, is a constructive, uh, uh, discussion as, as Tony agrees. Decision making under uncertainty is the norm in practice. Some people feel that decision makers can't deal with uncertainty. No, no, no. They, they deal with uncertainty all the time. What they really don't like is when you give them a surprise when you say, oops, I, I went back and did a refined mesh on this and oh no, it, it, your, your system doesn't have any margin or it's gonna fail. That is when they really get upset or if you get into the testing phase late in the program. And one of the quotes on this, courage is the only virtue that you cannot fake. I love that one from Nassim Talib. Thank you very much. And I have some references there. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, and really relevant talk and loads of valid points. Um, 
I would open the floor. Does it, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to unmute your microphone um, and, and say them. Any questions at all? I, I can just make some comments. The... I can make some comments. Yeah, please, Tony. That'd be great. <laughs> um, I wish I'd been taking notes all the way through, because <clears throat> uh, I lost track of how many times Bill misrepresented my opinions on things. Um, but there is a fundamental area where, where we disagree, um, and, and it can be identified in terms of the decision making. Of course, a lot of what he says about decision making is absolutely spot on, and. Uh, I didn't deal with it very much because I, I was dealing with the input that the scientists and the, the experts make to the decision making. The decision maker is an expert in his own right. Um, he has a lot of things to handle in addition to the, the, the specific uncertainties. But what we can do as scientists is to provide decision support in the form of appropriately assessing the uncertainties. and. I think, to be honest, Bill, if, if I went to a decision maker and I said, you asked me about this thing, and it, it could be anywhere between zero and one. And, um, and he asked, well, what's that based on? And I say, well, I know, for instance, this parameter lies between 1.8 and 2.2, but I know nothing else about that parameter. And he's gonna to say to me, how do you know it's between 1.8 and 2.2? Could it not be outside that range? How do you not know more than that? How, what, what? What information gave you that that can't tell you something more about it somehow being more likely to be two perhaps than something else? So I think it's just an abdication of the scientist's responsibility to give their best knowledge, best judgments to the decision maker to say, I know nothing except that it lies between 1.8 and 2.2. That it lies between 1.8 and 2.2 is a lie to begin with. And it's a lie to say you know nothing more. That's terrible. Uh, let me let me uh, come in on that, and then we'll have some other people also answer. Um, uh, Tony, you uh, I think are much too harsh on uh, saying that it's a lie. No, the the, the expert didn't say no. I, uh, uh, to accuse him of lying, I, I think that is completely uncalled for. If they say, this is the best state of knowledge that I have, and if you say, I don't like that, I'm gonna go get another expert. Okay, you can do that. Uh, or they may be unqualified. You could say whatever you want, but they're not lying to you. They're telling you, this is the state of knowledge. Is there a guarantee on the bound? No, no, this is what I think based on my experience, the data you have or whatever the situation is, this is the bound that you have, okay? That, that I believe you have. And your perspective is that it is an elicitation problem because you say it must, there must be some more knowledge here. And the expert says, no, that's actually all we have. And that is not acceptable from you, for you. And we say, no, we think it is better to take exactly what the expert said and show that to the decision maker. And if the expert says, for example, on this plot, if he says, I have no idea what to do with that. And I say, okay, well, let's do a sensitivity analysis. And he says, well, we don't have, uh, we don't have time for that. And, 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 and he says, I, I've got to make, I have to do something here. So then I say, is this useful? Yes, this can be useful. This is the bound on uncertainty. And this one you would say is given the assumptions of uniformity on all of the input parameters, this is the most likely outcome. And for example, when the uh, lost aircraft west of uh, Australia was being looked for, what procedure did they use? Bayesian estimation. That's absolutely what you do because the decision was, we are going to look for this aircraft. What are the most likely places for us to look? Okay, and that is an appropriate use, but that's a different kind of decision to say what is the given state of knowledge if we have to make a decision on safety. So uh, I appreciate your comment. Uh, any, uh, since we have a little bit more, let's come back, Tony, if you have any more uh, questions. Any other questions or comments people would like to make? 
I received a, a private message asking at the end of your presentation, uh, they weren't sure what is designated in precise probability theories versus classical probabilities, BBM, etc. I'm, I'm not I saying that that I didn't quite understand it. They said at the end, I didn't quite understand what was designated in precise probability theories versus classical probability, uh, BBM, etc. Um, that person is more than welcome to clarify. They sent it to me anonymously. Um, I hope that makes sense. Well, I'm I'm not sure. Let me. I'm not sure I understand the question. In traditional, when I say traditional probabilities, I, I include Bayesian estimation in that. Some people wouldn't do that. Okay, that's fine. But that that approach is such a dominant approach, which is of course when it's used in my view properly. And for example, on calibration. Absolutely, okay. But that's not what we're talking about here. The emphasis, and sometimes people have heard this term, it's being used more, more regularly now over the last uh, five to 10 years, this term predictive capability. When people talk about predictive capability, people say, oh, that sounds just like another buzzword. Now it actually is something a little bit different. It means what is your prediction for some future state given the present knowledge that we have. And that knowledge can, of course, be from many different sources. But primarily, these are models that are built on computational physics of some sort of thing. So it's not a statistical model. It's not simply massaging data. It is prediction based on physics. And many times, it is for in the future, like climate change, for example. And many times, it's also for systems in accident environments or hostile environments. What is the safety of the system? And of course, the intent is the system should never get in that state. But if it does, what is the safety of the system? So what do we predict that the safety will be? And with imprecise probabilities, you do have that flexibility, for example, on this one on the right, to represent poor stage of states of input data intervals, poor model forms, that is the epistemic, you could call it the discrepancy term, that's fine, okay. Estimations and the, the technique that we have been using, it is a, uh, it's a, it's a technique called using validation metrics, which Scott Fearson came up with an excellent one a number of years ago. Uh, it's a validation metric, it's a measure of the difference between experimental results and computational results. And that's a model form uncertainty, but it's not the same kind of model form uncertainty or discrepancy that Bayesian used because that of course uses the inverse solution technique and that validation metric now is usually in, in the forward sense. And then this other one is what is the numerical solution uncertainty? And so these things we're arguing that if you want to show those to a decision maker, uh, we believe that they should be shown because they may be aghast that how much uncertainty is there but this is what we believe our state of knowledge is. And if you want to go assume that the numerical solution error is zero, you want to assume that the model form uncertainty is zero. And if you would assume that everything is a uniform distribution, we'll give you one simple distribution right in the middle here. But that's not really the state of knowledge. So maybe I address the uh, question, not sure. Uh, Any questions? Other? Yes, how would you quantify the model uncertainty, the impact on results on systems which have never been, for which there's no data, some future perspective weapon system or other civil engineering endeavor for which there's actually no data, but the model form uncertainty might be significant. What would you do there? That, that is probably, in, in computational simulation, that is physics-based simulation, that is the most important, most worked research problem right now that I've seen. It's, it's really, you could say it's a statistical problem, but it really is. It's a physics error estimation problem. And uh, so to try to give you, the first thing is people are recognizing how important that is because it is exactly what you said. A validation metric or the discrepancy term with Bayesian calibration estimation, it is an estimation where you have data. Okay, that's exactly what it is. But as we move to more and more simulation based decision making, 
we are recognizing better and better as we mature in trying to understand this. I mean, this is all new, literally in my lifetime, Tony's lifetime, this reliance on simulation. This model form uncertainty, it is due to the approximations and assumptions made in the physics. It's where it comes from. But we have no idea on estimating that other than where we have data. Every, everybody says, okay, that's where we have it. So what are people doing for cases where we know we will never have data? And the, I think the most constructive approach that I've seen now is what's called multi-fidelity modeling approaches where they have a model, a given physics model, the primary model, and then they have no data, could be far in time, it could be usually on the engineering system. It's, for example, in an accident environment, which is so dangerous, we're not even gonna test it, but we have to have an idea, what is the model form uncertainty for those cases? So then higher fidelity models are constructed that have that are more reliable because they have much better physics but of course physics cost computation time okay and so we can't afford to do those so we are using these high fidelity models to essentially calibrate or estimate the model form uncertainty at these conditions where we do not have data and that i think is a very constructive way forward the analogous situation is in weather forecasting in over about the last particularly 10 years, maybe 15, but particularly the last 10 years, weather forecasters, for example, on hurricane predictions, they will show you results from multiple models, like sometimes you call spaghetti plots. That's a fantastic improvement in trying to inform the public about what is our predictive capability on the paths of these hurricanes. And I know I've had one relative of mine say, I look at those spaghetti plots and they're all over the place. They say, you guys don't know where this thing's going. I'd say, yeah, it's pretty uncertain, okay? But that is a much more informative, we argue, than going in there with some sort of, let's call it Bayesian model averaging and give me one line and they say, this is our prediction. And of course, when it hits way off from that, they say, you lied to me. Well, no, we actually didn't lie. We were not really tell you in the whole picture. So I think this whole issue of how physics is in different models with, for example, in hurricane prediction, that is a constructive way forward. Sometimes it's called alternate plausible models. So I think that's very positive. So I think in the case of uh, differential equation systems, having the different levels of uh, grid, uh, grid, uh, grid fineness, that's a pretty obvious way of uh, trying to assess what the impact of that is. But as far as the hurricane, maybe some other areas that are not that kind of pure physics the way you're describing it, but we there's still some system that you really don't know how things are gonna work. And we don't just, we just don't even have, we can't just make a high fidelity model no matter how much computation we put in. I guess then this question is how would you pick, is it based, would you have to pick, dream up as many alternate models as you can and then just do the sensitivity analysis to see what the range of results is as you just try to concoct alternate models. Can I, can uh, I comment on that? I, yeah, I, yeah, I'd be glad to because it, it is a very relevant question. Uh, In these, um, let, let's talk about hurricane models because it's, you know, it's a very relevant issue with physics-based models. Every one of those physics models has um, epistemic uncertainties in the input data or and aleatory, okay? They also have model form uncertainty and each one has its own model form uncertainty, discrepancy if you like, and each one has numerical errors and they're all different, okay? And so when you're given a path of a particular hurricane prediction, then these other pieces actually exist in there but the path that is shown to you is if there are any epistemic uncertainties like numerical error or model form, they are either ignored or they are represented with a uniform distribution. Show it shows you the most likely path that this model predicts. But do not think that those models have zero numerical error or zero model form uncertainty. So they actually have it in there, but 
Of course, you have to say, all right, we're going to show one path for this, but we're going to show you multiple model predictions, and that's great. The downside, of course, I think is obvious. The, the cost of doing these multiple models is expensive. For certain, let's call it uh, very high volume for the public, for example, on weather forecasting, the public expects those. Uh, of course, uh, air flight and uh, sea traffic, I mean, they expect these, okay? So that is a very important element in use of physics-based models. And then they will look at multiple models. And so there the investment has been made and it's a very positive step because they look at all of these different kinds of models if you have any kind of consequential decision. But when you have engineering decisions, then it is relatively rare that you will use multiple mathematical models to make a prediction. It is done at certain times. For example, in nuclear power safety, they look at multiple models. Underground storage of nuclear waste, they have multiple models that they look at and of course, all of the other uncertainties. So for high consequence decisions, it is an appropriate thing to do, but it is not done in the typical, let's say, uh, business process. Hopefully that helps. I have to interrupt there. Um, and it, it's essentially the, the discussion period now. And I think that's an excellent segue into our, our first uh, vice question, which is, must decisions and designs distinguish kinds of uncertainties I will just put it on the, the thing here. I, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, that's the discussion that I would like to propose to, to both Tony and, and Bill for them to, to talk about. And uh, I believe Scott will, will help facilitate if we go off track then or meander too much, then he'll bring us back to the question. Um, but for the next 30 minutes, we can, we can discuss the answer to this question. Okay, will you have other questions also, Francis? That's the only one. Oh, that's the only one, okay. And maybe others will come up from uh, some of the audience too. Yeah, please. Uh, anyone is welcome to, <clears throat> to say their points and it's an open discussion. Yeah, open discussion meaning uh, feel free to unmute yourself and speak and until it gets a little congested and then we might ask for something else. Several people have asked questions on the chat. You might wanna uh, unmute yourself and pose those if they're relevant. I have a question that's half relevant, but it's really something that both speakers raised, which might answer one part of this question, if it's okay for me to ask. Uh, I'll treat that no answer as a yes. So it seems to me that there's a really interesting contention between what Tony presented and what, what Bill presented. And Tony addressed it very briefly when he talked about and possibly you need to use event trees to estimate rare event probabilities and when you're talking about these extreme scenarios. And it seems that Will spoke quite a lot about, um, about um, the, the kind of the extreme event and, and the asymmetry that you have as perhaps a regulator when you're talking about high consequence events. So I wonder what both think, or, or I guess more what Tony thinks about the appropriateness of using and trying to aggregate as best estimates on our uncertainty as possible, knowing that in the tails, it's much, much more sensitive to those, the, the kinds of uncertainties that we might be able to distinguish that kind of begins to address this first question. Okay, well, since you fingered me first, I'll, I'll make some sort of effort at answering that. Um, the tails of distributions, the, the extreme uncertainties are, are terribly important in some kinds of decisions. There are many others where uh, what matters most is uh, the, the most, the, if you like, the, the likely area, the, the central part of, of the distribution. Uh, but where, where there is significant uh, risk element to the, the, the problem, uh, then the tails matter. And this isn't all, not all uh, business decisions are like this. Uh, they, they can be very uh, sensitive to the, the tails, but on the other hand, in lots of other situations, uh, the, the risks are pretty pretty linear with relation to the, the, the extremes. So it doesn't matter that much what happens in the extremes. But yeah, where it does, uh, clearly uh, you have to look at these things. Now, if you're doing a, a straightforward elicitation of the kind that I described, 
then part of your sensitivity analysis will be to look at distributions that fit the, the judgments the experts have made, but that uh, have different tails. So instead of fitting a, a normal distribution, for instance, if, it, if the uncertainty looks symmetric, you fit a T distribution. And you can fit both to the judgments they've made and, and both have, may very well fit more or less the same. <clears throat> but clearly the, the T distribution makes a completely different prediction right out in the tails. So we do that. I mean, the, the shelf software provides you to fit a T distribution with just three degrees of freedom uh, or choose your own degrees of freedom if you like, but the default is three. Uh, and, and that gives you another possible fit to use in your sensitivity analysis. Now, as you, as you can imagine, if, if the, t the decision is terribly sensitive to the tail, you will come up with the conclusion that uh, actually it matters whether we have that T distribution or the normal distribution or even a T distribution with different degrees of freedom. I can't then go back to these experts and say, uh, oh, sorry, we, we need to identify the, the, the tail here. If I know that that's a problem to begin with, then I would elicit things differently and we would start talking about what the various factors that lead to extreme events. So we'd be, we, we'd be looking at, if you like, the chain of events that leads to something extreme. And then we'd be breaking it down. We'd have a completely different elaboration to deal with it. So it does matter. And it, it's important to know what the decision problem is and how it's going to be sensitive to different sorts of things to help you to decide how to tackle the problem. But you, you can do it. And, and it usually would be meaningful to come up with an answer that enables the decision maker to make some sort of decision. Um, and, and, I, and I repeat, just telling them, sorry, it can't, I can't do this because it just could be anywhere. It's not an answer that any scientist should be, be able to, allowed to do. It's crazy. So, so if, if I understood what you said there correctly, if, if I changed the word kinds in that question in front of us to sources, you would say absolutely yes. Well, yes, I mean, I, I don't actually quite understand the question here, um, but what, the decision or the design at the end of the day is, is an answer. Um, but as, as in all situations, you, you need to elaborate and explain your answer, say where it comes from. And in doing that, you may very well identify different sources of uncertainty that have different kinds of uncertainty associated with them. Um, you, if, you, if you're working with me, you'll have used probabilities for all of them um, and you'll have elicited carefully what uncertainties there are on them. But yeah, you could, you will probably state uh, as you go through uh, the different components of this because that's part of the process and it will be documented as you did it. Let me uh, let me also provide a uh, perspective on this. I think Tony and I agree on the importance of epistemic uncertainty, lack of knowledge, in the tails of these distributions in rare events. There. Those are the situations that are the most sensitive to lack of knowledge, okay? You could get these large probability boxes as we showed or you know, from evidence theory, belief and plausibility. You can get these, but you see those are very significant even in the middle of the distribution. But clearly the sensitivity of risk on rare events to epistemic uncertainty is by far the most sensitive. And I guess I'm arguing, and I'm not sure if Tony is arguing the same, maybe, maybe we would agree on this on the tails of the distributions. When you were dealing with consequential rare events, then to better inform the decision makers what, how much uncertainty there is, let's say from conflicting experts or maybe physics models it can be completely different. It is, I believe, important to let these decision makers know how uncertain our result is. Let's pick a relevant example. Let's pick climate change. Are there uncertainties there? There are huge uncertainties, okay? And one of the biggest ones in long-term prediction, of course, is the model form uncertainty. It is from all of the approximations and assumptions in the model, okay? And when you have multiple models that are being used, which is a very, positive step forward in comparing different models on these long-term predictions and how much variability there is, you could say divergence between these predictions, that is really important 
for you could say decision makers, policy makers, politicians to see, because that is how much uncertainty is actually there. So Tony, would you agree that they, they should see that for these long-term predictions? Uh, uh, yeah, sure, but uh, we might do it differently. So uh, what they would see if, if I was involved with doing this is they would see um, all the different judgments that were made about different parameters the experts that, that made them, they, they won't have those experts named to them, but they'll know the ones that were involved. Uh, they'll see the range of initial opinions the experts had. They'll see the, the nature of the discussion that followed and the final conclusion and some sensitivity statements about that final conclusion. So they'll see where it all came from um, and they'll see that for every single parameter. Um, but what, while we're at it, um, when we're talking about these extremes, can you really justify putting hard bounds on a parameter that says this one lies between 1.8 and 2.2 when extremes matter so much? Nobody knows it does lie between 1.8 and 2.2. That's a judgment. And it's a judgment that is saying with some, in some sense, high, high degree of certainty, high degree of confidence, high probability, however you want to express it. This expert thinks it's between 1.8 and 2.2, but it's not saying it's certainly there, but you're, 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 uh, boxes are going to be bounded by that, are they not? Okay, you mentioned that earlier, and I'm glad you mentioned it again, because you're focusing on the bounds of these intervals. That's yeah. like you're losing track of the, you know, the forest with the trees. That's that's not the issue. The issue is the uncertainty that is over the range, and if you make the bounds bigger, clearly the probability box or the interval will it will increase. But that's not the that's not the emphasis. It's, it's focusing on the wrong thing. The focus should be on how much uncertainty there is, even given this range, and there's nothing that can be said in between. That is the issue. Can the bounds be wrong? Certainly they can be wrong, just like an expert can be wrong, but that's not the issue. The issue that we're contending is to let the decision maker know how much uncertainty there is to this kind of thing. That's the point. But, but well, we disagree on that, obviously, but I, I still don't think you're telling the, the decision maker how much uncertainty there is because you're bounding it in some way. And as you said yourself, you increase those bounds, you, your box gets bigger, the decision maker gets a different expression of, of what, in whatever terms you're, you're, you're giving that uncertainty, gets a different statement from you. Um, so Can I ask I'm, 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 I'm going to say... Yeah, those, those parameters probably lie within the range as you've stated, but I'm going to allow for some probability outside that, not a very big probability and how big may matter, but that's going to be an honest statement that goes through into the, into the final analysis, it's an honest judgment, a scientific judgment. Okay, and, and let, me, let me briefly answer that because in evidence theory, you can do exactly what you said you can have probabilities outside that range. It is not necessarily a pure interval. So you can have these mixtures. And of course, I, I don't know if you realize it or not, you can have exactly what you're, what you're talking about. If there is a possible range outside, you can do that. Probability bounds analysis, it's difficult to do that one. But in evidence theory or denser shaper theory, you can do exactly what you said. So that is not a limitation of imprecise probability. You, you could say it's a limitation of probability bound analysis. Okay, I'd agree with that. Maybe Scott would, but uh, it, it is not a, it is not a restriction or a limitation of evidence of evidence theory. That's not what it is. Could, can I ask one more follow on to mine, and then someone else can take over because um, I've asked a lot of questions. So, in the context where we were talking about those extreme events again, Tony, and you said, okay, well, I might use the student T as opposed to using the Gaussian if I want to put more weight in those tables. Doesn't that kind of assumption naturally lend itself to then creating a P box where you have where where your implicit assumption about the shape of that distribution and you offer the decision maker both? You say this is if it is normally distributed. This is if it's if it's a student T distribution. Doesn't that naturally lend itself to the P box sort of frame in it, whether you want to call it that or not? There, there is no, no I, true. There is no true distribution. It's not either this or that. It's just. The, the distribution that represents the experts' beliefs and knowledge about the thing. So, if if you know if if when we're in one of these situations, I frequently ask the experts that 
that wouldn't they rather use a heavy tail distribution here to allow for a little bit more uncertainty? Um, so yes, obviously in a situation where the, the, the sheer weight of that tail is so important, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have got to that point. But, but where, where we're dealing with a problem where it isn't that crucial, it's, I still would typically ask them, wouldn't you rather give a bit more uncertainty out here? But it's their judgment. It's not, I'm not going to be reporting, oh, it, I decided it could be normal or I decided it could be a T and I'll leave it to you to, to, to think which you want. I'll report that this is what the experts on the day felt was the best representation of the state of knowledge in the field about that parameter today. And, and that's, that's what I'm giving them. And that to me seems to me what the, what the decision maker wants. He wants to know what you think. He doesn't want to know there's some crazy un, unspecified range of anything could happen in this range. He knows that. What he wants to know is what is your judgment about what's actually likely. I guess I'd answer the question. The, the, to me, the point of the question was, suppose you had two different distributions there with the Gaussian versus T, or you could say two other families. And uh, it seems to me that the Tony's uh, approach would be to some way, it's usually called aggregation, or merge these two into whatever quote was a consensus, and then to show the decision maker the result. Suppose this is on one particular parameter. And I guess I'm arguing on the side that if this is an important parameter, then why not show the result due to, and I suppose there's no agreement between them, except the, the, the expert elicitator, he may say, all right, you two don't agree on this, but I'm gonna merge you, I'm gonna merge these opinions and I'm gonna show one result. And of course, what can be done, and sometimes it is done, is to say, I'm gonna show you both, I'm gonna show the decision maker both results, and that is to me the kind of positive step that we're arguing because that is very similar to a robust Bayesian estimation where I'll show you the whole set. For example, the same kind of path has been taken or the same kind of approach has been taken on hurricane paths. People find the, the spaghetti plots are much more informative than a simple model averaging process. Tony may disagree that he thinks all the models, either input or model uncertainty should be average. And I contend, no, I think it's actually more informative to the public because there is a much wider range, for example, a long time in the future. And that lets people know, yes, there is actually a lot of uncertainty and you may live 100 or 200 miles away from where the most likely event is, but don't think that, that these are that precise. So that's the way I would answer the question. Okay, two, two things. First, I never, ever arbitrarily blend or merge or average experts' probability judgments. Roger Cook does that. I never do that. What I do is I get the experts to debate and think about what would be a reasonable overall opinion to take. Secondly, when we talk about hurricanes, that, that is a nice example. I worked on this many years ago, straight after Katrina, in fact, it was the following year or the year after that, um, I was involved in a licitation which was done for the, for the benefit of the insurance industry. We held this meeting in, in, uh, in Florida, um, on Miami Beach uh, in November. I remember it was, even though it's supposed to be after the hurricane season, there was another one serious storm coming through. It was a terrible day on Miami Beach, but we sat there and we did the solicitation. Now, what we did was the organizers presented a whole bunch of models. And I actually worked with the experts to decide what they judged were the more plausible or less plausible models. And we averaged them, if you like, but we averaged them according to what those experts judged was more likely to be the, the the, the best represent, not necessarily a true model, no, no model's true, but what was the, going to be the more likely scenario for projecting the, the future? And they were being specifically asked how many landfalling category four or five hurricanes uh, will there be in the next 10 years um, landfalling on the coast of mainland USA? And they were completely wrong. They were completely wrong. It's a nice example because, in fact, over the next 10 years, there were, I think, none. 
but the eleventh year there were three. So, you know, they they made their best judgment. But what they were actually judging was not what happened in this next ten years, but what they would typically expect to find in a ten year period of this kind. We had an unusual ten years. The next ten years are different. So. You know, that, that was an example, and that is exactly what we did. We, we got the experts to do the averaging, and that, and that worked as far as they were concerned. The point is that it gave the industry, which is the insurer who was going to be deciding what premiums to charge, some useful information. They saw all the range of predictions. Of course they did as part of the information they're given, but they also get these experts' decisions about what is the more likely values. And the experts were drawn from all corners of the world to, for this meeting. It was a serious high-level meeting. Okay, so if I understand, it seems that you were saying two different things. It seems that, are you saying they were, that the in, insurers, people don't, if you've never worked with insurance companies, they've got skin, skin in the game. They're the ones that say, this is what the policy premiums will be. And so when these results were shown, were all of the results from all these different kinds of models from these different prediction models, they were shown to the, the insurance agencies? Of course, of course, that's part of the, part of the okay. documentation that we I think, think we agree on that. That is the very positive step forward because it shows all of this divergence of these different models, which have all different kinds of inputs. So that is the kind of, uh, I, I think, uh, informative decision-making that's moving in the right direction. Any other questions that people are having? So I have a small question, which is kind of related, um, but I feel like you kind of got there on your own already. So I was still find, trying to find the least common denominator between you two. And I don't think that Tony is that far away. It's, I mean, the, so for me, it feels like a good step, like an introduction to it. Imprecise probability would be to view it as a formalized framework for the sensitivity analysis that you're also proposing, Tony. And so, I mean, how far you want to drive this sensitivity analysis is a whole different subject, but would you, would you object to that, to just viewing it as like a formalized framework for, for the sensitivity analysis? Yeah, I mean, I advocated sens sensitivity analysis as my, as my rule too. Uh, on the slide before that, I said, I don't believe in uh, anything which says there's a, there's hard bounds to how far your sensitivity analysis should diverge from the, the central elicited distribution, nor do I feel that your sensitivity analysis should in any sense take the view that the, the variations from that central value are equally likely or, or, or we have no idea whether one is more likely than the other. Uh, so within those constraints that I don't accept the, the sort of the formal um, nature of those imprecise probability calculations, um, I do still uh, believe that sensitivity analysis looks a bit like imprecise probabilities, which of course it is because all those probability judgments are imprecise. But we've done our best, and that's the important part about rule one. Rule one is never accept somebody telling you, I don't know anything about this parameter. Sit them down, get them to talk, get them to talk with other experts. They'll soon tell you much, much more. I think it's called forcing the experts. No, it's not forcing them. Oh, it's exactly what you said. <laughs> You said, I will not let you out of here until I get this. That's what you said. I, I, I do want to no. say something to that point because I have been in front of uh, experts where they will ask you questions. And if you do not tell them, I do not know, they will throw you out for lying to them because they will purposely ask you questions in ways that no one knows. And I've seen this, I mean, from grad school all the way up to now in my professional career, because one of the, I mean, if you don't know the person in front of you, one a good way to judge an expert is to ask them a question that nobody really knows the answer to and see if they admit, we don't know the answer to this. Because a lot of times what I find in my own career are experts are much more forthcoming with where their information begins and ends. And it's the people who are trying to pretend they're experts that will pretend they know a lot more than they actually do. Interesting. Um, I, I think that's yeah. a good... That's a good point, Josh. It, uh, it, it, it is an issue that um, there are qu clearly questions that 
you know, I have no idea about this, or of course, one statement of saying, I mean, I have no idea, is to put a bounds on something. And as Tony has said multiple times, that is an unacceptable answer that you just say, I have a bounds. And we contend that no, we actually see that a lot more than he does. And in the example we had just moved into on these, uh, on the hurricane examples, those are model form uncertainties. Those are not opinions, okay? Those are, those are predictions from, from very complex simulations. And those are the realities of the state of the art in modeling simulation for, let's we'll say, weather or hurricane. That is the state, okay? I, I, I always begin by saying, I do not expect you to know the answer. I don't expect you to claim to know the answer. What I want to know is a, an honest statement of how much uncertainty you have. And that is not, a, it's not an honest statement to just say, I know it lies between here and here, okay? An honest statement is a proper representation of how much you know and how much you don't know. We do ask for bounds, first of all, but these are what I call plausible bounds, not absolute bounds. They are just bounds that they would be very surprised if the truth lay outside that. We start with that to avoid anchoring issues. We start with that so we have the whole range set out to begin with. Then we start moving in and asking for a, a median value. Okay, so what's a value you think would be, you'd be, is just as likely for this thing to be above or below? I've never had experts that have any great difficulty with thinking about that. It's a kind of estimate. And it's, a, you know, it may not be central in those bounds. It may be typically, actually, it's often more at the lower end because these are positive quantities that are more likely to be variable up than down. Um, yeah, they don't have difficulty with doing this. And when you start saying that, and then you start saying, well, is it as likely to be right at the edge of your bounds or somewhere in the middle? What do you judge that? Well, they're never gonna say, I think it's just as likely to be within, right at the edge of plausibility as it is to be somewhere in the middle. No, that's not what they believe. Incidentally, can we if we change something else has been mentioned several times by by Bill? Um, oh, sorry, my phone's going. That's, my wife hopefully will answer that. Um, if we if we talk about um, this this uh, model discrepancy uncertainty, just one of the one of the tricks that's kind of useful here um, is is to ask the ask the modeler what would they do to their model if they were given another million dollars to develop it a bit more? What would they do to the model? What is the, what is the key part of the model that they would want to change to get more, more verification, more validity to this, to this model? And then you ask them what, what effect it would have on the answer, on the outputs. And, and they can generally give you some idea about that. So that, that gives you some notion, that it's a small handle, but it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a handle on what, what is the model discrepancy there, even for a model which hasn't been tested yet. So can I ask yeah, you, I, go ahead or a comment? Um, we've seen a question about a least common denominator between Tony and, and Bill. And I do appreciate that because I'm a practicing, uh, more or less a practicing engineer. And I, I appreciate when people kind of offer a practical consensus. Can then in that view, um, what Bill's been talking about be seen as like a first preliminary step to what Tony's talking about, what you just said. So we start with these P-box type of imprecise probabilities and we, we converge on something more concrete, like the P box converges on a, on a more or less on a CDF or a, or something tighter. So that's my question. If I understand the question, uh, I you I, the way you're thinking about P box, I I think most people that use probability bounds analysis think about them a little bit different. You characterize it as initial. Maybe you could say that, but. It doesn't have to be thought of that way. It may be that given the amount of time, uh, let's say, and experts that you have, uh, if you say, what is your opinion on this input quantity? And they may give you a interval, or they may give you a distribution, or they may give you a distribution with interval valued probabilities. Okay, you can, interval valued parameters, you could do that also. And so, but wherever you have any kind of interval in there, you will produce an interval value probability on the result. And so 
with additional time and money, you can improve the model. You can improve the input data from the experts. So all of the, you could get more money, you could get a bigger computer and we could reduce the numerical solution error. These are all things that could be done with additional, let's say funding or time. And those, those can be valuable because that starts to move into the question of a decision maker that says, all right, I don't have to make a decision on this right now, but tell me what are the most valuable from a sensitivity analysis? What are the biggest contributors if I contribute time and money that you can reduce the uncertainty? That of course is a very important practical question. And so I think Tony and I agree on the importance and the practicality of sensitivity analysis. But I think where we disagree is when you have very poor knowledge on things, that is intervals, or you have model form uncertainty, or you have numerical error or iterative error, whenever you have those, to show the decision maker the impact of those things. This is, this is, what, this is what they are. They, because they are, in, the, in, in I think Tony agrees with me on, on the numerical errors, those are not random errors. Those are bias errors in the solution. And as you invest more time, particularly computing time, you can resolve those issues. But when decision makers have to make a decision, they say, okay, you may go off and do that, but I need to make a decision right now. What is your estimate of the uncertainty? And the key difference between traditional probability and imprecise probability is that imprecise probability, the decision maker is given a range of probabilities. Based on our knowledge, the probability range will be this to this, okay? That is a less informative answer than saying the probability will be a particular number. But the question is, what did it take to get to a single probability? So the key issue on imprecise probabilities, whether it's probability bounds analysis, P-boxes, or dempster Schaefer, is the whole concept of interval value probabilities has proven to be very useful to many decision makers, particularly in high consequence decisions. That's the contention. Can I just briefly add that um, elicitation doesn't come for free. Um, doing a good job is never free. So there's a cost to running a serious exercise in assessing these probabilities. And if you don't have that fund available, um, you have to accept something lesser. Uh, I, I work in situations where the consequences are important uh, and where the decision makers understand that getting good input to that decision in terms of understanding the uncertainties, which is a part of the decision making question, um, that's worth spending money on. The elicitation is, is not even that cheap. Very often people don't understand that, but it's still a lot cheaper than going out and running new experiments or collecting other sorts of data. So it can be a very valuable and cost-effective process. But if you don't have the money for that, then probably your decision wasn't worth actually spending the money on in the first place. Any other questions? Do we have any time left, Francis? Uh, and in fact, we've slightly run over by five minutes, but I didn't want to interrupt the flow of the conversation. Um, officially, the, the meeting has adjourned. Um, I just have one announcement um, of the, the schedule. So there'll be a talk tomorrow at 4 p.m. Um, GMT um, with uh, Ming Minge V, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, and Vladek Fenovich. Um, and they'll be discussing what would a unified and uncertainty calculator look like. There's a series of other talks as well. Some of them are still to be confirmed. Um, all the Zoom link details will be in the email announcement. But for the sake of the discussion, I would urge people to stick around and continue the conversation. Um, we'll stop the recording here, but by all means, please, please continue. I think someone raised a valid point around the, the satellite problem, uh, especially addressing Tony. I don't mm. know if he's noticed the chat. Um, if someone wants to mention that, I guess I can throw the uh, the grenade in. Just 